This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Yo, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. I got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is we got another awesome guest for this week's show. An absolute stud when it comes to smallmouth fishing. Well, all bass fishing in general, but specifically smallmouth. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Probably a little bit of big water smallmouth, maybe some inland lakes. I don't know where the conversation is going to go, but I'm super excited uh, to have him on. The bad news is, guys, look at the calendar. We're almost done with season one. Like, done. What do I do with my life? What are we going to do on a weekly basis? Couple options. End this show right now. Call it season one. Call it good. I don't know. Option two, because this was so much work. I enjoy doing it. Just a lot of work. Option two, we continue with season two into, what is it, 2022? We could, but what's the topic? You know, this year, it was all about the top smallmouth anglers across the country. And we can't just keep having them back on, although we could try. That'd be a lot, a lot of work. Hey, hey, Scott, you mind coming back on again? Hey, Steve Clapper, you want to come back on? Sure, we'd love to talk to these guys, but we got to mix it up a little bit. And I need your help. So in the comments if you could let me know what you would like to see, perhaps, from a Smallmouth Crush podcast season two. I have some ideas. I certainly have some ideas. It's going to take a little bit of work, but I think we can uh, I think we can make it work together. So let me know if you have any awesome ideas. I'd love to hear about it. Before we get to our next guest, let's talk, of course, about the real shot. They've been with us all season long. It's where I get all my tackle. Well, when they have, have it in stock. You know how it's been. It's been crazy. But if you head on over to therealshot.com and use my code smallmouthcrush15, you're going to get 15% off your first order, which is pretty cool. Save a little bit of money, and they do got some great bass tackle over that. They got some hunting stuff, too, a lot of hunting stuff. So if you're a hunter, if you're into that, you definitely want to check out the Real Shot. They uh, certainly have a lot of great products. And, again, take advantage of that code smallmouthcrush15. Well, let's do it. Let's bring them on. Benjamin, how are you doing today? Good, man. How are you? It's been a long time coming. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, this is going to be great, man. I know you uh, know how to put some smallmouth in the boat. You've had some awesome videos. I actually just got done watching one where you were uh, catching them on your live scope, deep water, smallmouth, uh, awesome stuff. I was really intrigued by that screen color. Yeah, dude, that's a might, new one. We might have to talk about that here uh coming up so i you know before we get started in case anyone's not familiar with yourself can you give us a little bit of background and um kind of where you're at today and, and what you have planned here in the future yeah for sure uh my name is benjamin noak as travis introduced me um but i'm actually from michigan so i smallmouth fish the great lakes a lot that includes huron uh, especially and then st Clair, which is a really great lake but it basically might as well be um i play around in erie in michigan as well but really huron's my home base i like to target deep water smallmouth and i like to consider myself pretty decent looking at them on live scope like really we'll touch on it and this is not a live scope ad but it really changed the way that i fish and targeted smallmouth because before that i was a lot or very much so a largemouth fisherman like to go shallow like to largemouth fish so like having that technology really changed the way that I fished. And that's when I started getting out on the great lakes and really, I mean, finding some success doing that. So that's something that I think, uh, has been an important factor in my ability to chase some of these fish, but wow. yeah, I mean, that's a little bit about me over the last, I guess, six years is where I really developed my live scope and uh, smallmouth ability. Yeah. You've had this technology for quite a while and I totally agree. It has, it's addicting. It's a fun way to fish. You hear two different sides to the story, right? Oh, you guys can't fish without electronics. You know, listen, 
when I go out fishing, man, I and I've said this before. I like to set the hook. Okay. So if I have a tool that's going to allow me to set the hook more, I'm going to take advantage of that. I would much rather set the hook than sit there and make cast after cast and have a crappy day. Um, I want to enjoy my time when I'm on the water. And a lot of people talk about how expensive this equipment. I mean, the guys that are complaining about how expensive the equipment is have no problem buying a fifty, sixty thousand dollar boat and a forty, fifty thousand dollar truck. And um, you know, what I mean, it's it's it goes it goes even beyond like setting the hook for me. Like the the fact that it's taught me so much about how these fish actually react and move around areas, and you can physically see how they act react to baits and like it's actually given me perspectives that have helped me become a different or better angler right like understand how fish act under different circumstances how they move around boulders and it's basically take my learning curve from what would probably have taken me 15 plus years to learn and made me be able to learn some of these things in six years that mm -hmm. i think have have helped my ability to go and catch smallmouth like how they act during sunlight or during like really sunny, flat, calm days versus, you know, sunny and windy days. Like you see how these fish suspend and how they move and how they chase bait and how they roam around areas. Like that for me is the biggest benefit of it as opposed to just being able to set the hook. And I don't want it to be a whole live scope discussion, but I think that's one of the biggest things that guys overlook. They think it's just about targeting that specific fish, but really cutting down on the learning curve has been the biggest thing for me. Hmm. Interesting. What is your favorite way to fish and, and use your live scope? Deep water boulders, like deep water, looking at like some piece of hard cover and figuring out how the fish are relating to it. And I guess it could be structure too, like looking at drop offs and looking at pieces of structure as it, as it kind of the main, the main contour changes. So like inside turns and stuff, how they're actually setting up on it. Cause with live scope, you obviously have really good mapping. Everyone has good mapping now. You can scope around and see exactly where they're sitting on that specific piece of structure and really make targeted casts to it. So I like deep water stuff. Um, I can I can shallow water fish, and there are ways to use it in shallow water. But for me, that deep water stuff and seeing a meet your bait is really cool. When it comes to live scope and and being able to have you know many hours behind that technology and, and utilizing it, what are some interesting things that you've seen when it comes to smallmouth behavior that maybe you haven't thought of before, you know, before this technology. The biggest thing is how they actually react to baits. I think a lot of guys, this is largemouth and smallmouth specific or largemouth and smallmouth, not specific to smallmouth. They don't necessarily, in my opinion, eat your bait on bottom because that's where those fish are sitting. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again, where you flip a bait out there and there's a small mouth suspended six foot up off the bottom and he sees your bait and he comes up to it and then goes back down and eats it on bottom after you've been dragging it a while. But I think a lot of fish are actually suspended up in their round mm -hmm. cover, especially when you're fishing around boulders, you're, you're fishing around grass. I was on St. Clair and there's these big tall grass beds right now, like, 10 foot off the bottom and 17 foot of water. These fish are suspended up on the edges of the grass. And if you flip that bait 15 foot outside the grass, those fish will see it. They'll come over to it and come down and eat it on bottom. Without live scope, you normally would say, okay, well, that fish was sitting on bottom and I'm dragging my drop shot along. I think a lot of these fish that we're catching, whether they're smallmouth or largemouth, are actually suspended up and they followed that bait down. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's I, a really cool thing that that I think it's taught me. I, I cannot argue. I think it's uh, it's actually surprised me the amount of uh, smallmouth that suspend. Um, blows my mind, actually. It's crazy. There is more fish suspended out there at times than they are hugged tight to the bottom. Like, that's well, the most eye-opening being bait fish oriented, right? Like smallmouth. Okay. We can talk about this too. Gobies versus bait fish, but like smallmouth by nature are looking for a really easy meal. I think bait fish are actually for the most part, a more normal part of their diet than gobies are. And so by nature, they're suspended up because that's where a lot of the bait fish are. And so I think it's actually easy for them to hang out up in the water column than it is to be low in the water column where they have to travel a long ways to come up and actually eat the bait. So by sitting 
five, six foot of off bottom, especially when there's no current and nothing forcing them to be down there. To me, it's really cool to see. It, it makes a lot more sense now that I can see it. Right, right. When you're targeting these fish on isolated boulder structure, you know, some of the, the things that you talked about that you love doing with live scope, what is your favorite technique or maybe not favorite, but what's the most uh, useful tool? A, dr a drop shot for sure. And what for is sure. your typical Just, setup for that? So the biggest thing with drop shot, it falls super straight. So like wherever I drop it in the water, it's going to fall pretty much straight down. So I'm going with like weight's going to be dependent um, on depth. But normally I'm going with the three eighths ounce or heavier. Just so I want to get it down in front of them. Um, a pretty long leader most of the time, like 18 plus inches. Most of the time I'm fishing the drop shot in deeper water. It's going to be longer than 18 inches. And then uh, owner sniper hook. It's a Nico style hook with a flat worm, a flat nose minnow, something max scent. Mm. Right on. Now, yeah. as far as your setup with uh rods and reels um oh. are you more of a medium light a medium and then so, also talk to you a little bit about the line is it braid the floral or what's your uh perfect setup when it comes to drop shotting yeah my favorite rod right now uh tfo tactical elite it's a new lineup from tfo they're getting back in the bass world but it's seven one so it's a little bit longer rod um, especially in deep water i want like a longer than six ten because i want to move some line um, but it's a, they call it a medium light. It's more like a medium moderate. So it bends deeper in the rod. And I really wouldn't go my preference. I don't go anything lighter than like a medium. I, I want to really be able to set the hook. I want to be able to move that fish when I set the hook and then I'll play the fish with the drag on the reel. So it's a seven one medium light, uh, moderate fast. It's a 3000 size Revo MGX. So it's a fast, uh, high speed gear ratio reel. And then it's eight pound test braid to eight pound test floor caramel later. Perfect. Yeah. Pretty, pretty standard, uh, yeah. setup when it comes to drop shotting. I think that's been the general theme throughout this, uh, this season on the small mouth crush podcast. Uh, I love hearing what everyone's setup is and more often than not, it's really light braid to a uh, eight pound floral carbon leader. And, and really the, the rod action, whether it be medium, medium light kind of really depends on that individual's, preferences and i guess what they have you know the most the most confidence in so talk to me a little bit about lake huron so i i've dabbled there a, a few times i fished it a, few, a handful of times but uh, i i would have no idea where to start it's massive right so there's little zones i'm sure that you pick apart and that you're learning uh, i definitely want to hear about those but i also want to hear about your ideas on other areas uh in lake huron that you maybe feel there's some amazing fishing, but without, I'm sure there's a lot less pressure, uh, on Lake Huron than some of the other great lakes. So talk to me about that. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. No, it doesn't really get that much pressure over the last two years. It's probably gotten a little bit more pressure, um, because guys are realizing their boats like can get out there and they aren't going to die every time they go out. Like that's one of the biggest things forever. There was this misconception you go out there and it's just going to be the worst, like roughest day of your life. And it gets big, but I don't think it gets any bigger than any of the other great lakes. You just have to be smart about it. Um, but fish is huge. Like it fish is really, really big. And I think that's because there's not a lot of stuff to hold the fish, right? So there's small areas that are really, really good. And then there's a lot of dead water out there because it's not like St. Clair where there's just fish everywhere. Like guys just think, well, on St. Clair, I can drop my boat in the lake and catch them here on, you have to be pretty dialed in on like, okay, they're on very specific stuff and they move a lot. Um, so it's just been a lot of like trials and tribulations. You go out there and you feel like a hero one day, you smash them and then you go out the next day and you just, Mm -hmm. never want to go back but it's a cool body of water um and not super easy and it's big water so it's big waves big fish when you talk structure uh you know a limited amount of structure what is the general is it just because it gets it's really it's deep flat flat no it's it's very flat like a deep spot on lake huron in the saginaw bay where i fish mainly is like 35 to yeah, I would say about 35 foot of water is pretty deep and it doesn't get much deeper until you move to the outer bay. And mm -hmm. so it's very flat. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of sand. Okay. And then you have small areas with rock. 
And there's some areas with like glacial deposits of rock and like boulder fields, but for the most part, it's like a lot of sand. So you're looking for grass, you're looking for uh, small micro contour changes with hard spots on them. Um, and really just protected areas. Like that's way how you, that's how you decide where you're going out that day is which way is the wind blowing from? Cause I want to go out on the, the calm side. So that's interesting. So I, I would say my weakness when it comes to, and only because I don't get to experience it as often as I'd like would be, uh, sand, you know, but the bottom contents primarily sand. How do you even target that? And do these fish hold on sand? And what are you looking for when, when you are fishing sand? So they do hold on sand a lot, but the biggest thing that I'm looking for is actually mixtures. So you're looking for those glacial deposits where there's like rock mixed in the sand. And more oftentimes than not, unless they're the big, big boulders, like giant boulders, the size of your truck, they don't necessarily want to get on that stuff. A lot of times they roam that sand and they hang out on the edges of it. Mm. Um, and I think mainly what they're using it for is just somewhere that it breaks the current a little bit because there's natural currents with the wind and the waves. And um, so they're just looking for kind of like the eddy you or the, I don't know what you would call it, like the backside of boulder fields where the water is not flowing quite as hard. They can hang out in there and they can just ambush stuff as it comes by or feed on whatever's living in the same area. Um, but the other big thing is grass, man. Like we fish so much grass on Lake Huron because there's so much sand you just look for the tall stalks of grass where the perch get around or the bait fish move through and that's what you're looking for a lot but that's How changed over the past couple of years the average depth of this grass what are what are we talking as far as fishable water above you like 13 you? foot 13 okay. to 13 to 15 foot of water is mainly so not crazy deep lives. not no. crazy deep no you can crank and throw jerk bait pretty much all year and catch fish um but you have so many different water clarities. So Huron is made up of the inner bay and outer bay. And as you move towards the outer bay, it basically gets clearer and clearer water. So on the inner bay where the river flows out, you have really, really dirty water. Like mm -hmm. I would say for some guys, it's maybe not really dirty, but it's maybe two to three foot visibility. As mm -hmm. you get to the outer bay, you're talking like 15 plus foot. Um, so huge, drastic water difference. Um, and, and it basically changes the whole bay is like different areas. You break, I break it down by different lakes. So the ramp would basically be my lake. And then I fish it different ways, depending on which ramp I'm launching out of. Okay. So it's pretty cool. I mean, that's basically yeah. the way that I break down that body of water. I, I go out with different plans for different ramps because they all fish pretty different. As good as you know, it is there. Do you ever surprise yourself? Do you ever run across things that you that you've missed in the past, or, or is there more to explore? I guess is what I'm getting at. A lot, man. Like mm -hmm. I spend a decent amount of time out there, but there's so much water. Like you couldn't cover it in a lifetime. And when those college kids they came up here, they found stuff I had no clue about. Like wow, I'm shocked that they were able to come up here and just launch out there and find some stuff it's just massive there's so much stuff you get different eyes on it people fish it different ways and people find new things it's so big right. no i think that's interesting and that always intrigues me when a new person or uh, a new group of anglers that may not have that much experience on the body of water go there they don't have preconceived notions they don't have spots they don't have areas they don't have history they just kind of go with the flow and oftentimes uh someone's going to stumble into something interesting and yeah, exactly. uh, it sounds like it, you know, I, I remember watching a little bit of that tournament and just catching some of the pictures and even some of the places they were fishing to me, it didn't seem like, uh, it would be a small mouth area, but I yeah. guess I was wrong. And I think I'm yeah. referring that could be totally wrong, but was, is there a lot of grass that grows on top of the water as well? Like reeds and stuff or, um, the whole bay through. is lined. Yeah, it is. So okay. It's, the whole bay is lined with these tall reeds like phragmite and pencil reeds and pads and it's phenomenal phenomenal largemouth fishing hmm. but i didn't realize some of the population of smallmouth these kids were catching out of these reeds which i think i don't know necessarily they were targeting smallmouth but some of these kids were catching some smallmouth out of reeds and i'm like man never hmm. have i seen this like the sure. locals don't talk about it and there's just not that much pressure that's one of the really unique things too is so untapped it's not like eerie and it's not like ontario and i guess ontario is starting to get there but where 
it's just so untapped. They don't have tournaments out there. It's just very unpressured. And so constantly learning more and more about it. Mm -hmm. But the rest of Lake Huron, Saginaw Bay, I would say, is now the most tapped area of Lake Huron, just in general. How about other zones? Have you experimented outside of that bay? And do you yeah. want to? And I would want you? to. I want to a lot. Like Georgian Bay seems so yeah. awesome. Like the northern parts, um, yeah. there's Georgian, there's um, all those parts up in the UP that have those big fingers that run into the lake. They look awesome. I've never been, but I want to go. Um, Let me ask you a stupid question, maybe. Uh, could you run your boat to, is it Georgian Bay? Yeah. Could you run yeah. it there? You'd have to be so lucky to get like the right weather. If you bounce from port to port, you could do it. Could you get there on a tank of gas and back? No. No. So you would have to trailer realistically to, if you wanted to explore it. You'd have to yeah. spend some time up in that zone. Yeah, you're talking a couple hundred miles. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So. Man. Yeah. So, like, what's your thought on this? Current-driven smallmouth, especially on big water, right? Like, how much have you noticed current driving these fish, especially where they hang out? And, like, you fish the big water a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think it's important, but I'll tell you what. I've had days with what I would consider some awesome current moving over structure, and you whack them, and you go back three days later with the same current and they're not there so okay. yes and no you know what i mean like just because you have the perfect current they're still smallmouth they're gonna do stupid things that smallmouth do and that just <laughs> leap for reasons we have no idea yeah um so like you, you know i try to think about that stuff where hey this area this is kind of how the current was flowing you know one of the coolest things uh and and to the listeners and viewers that follow this podcast in the past uh we've had some guests that fish on on lake erie uh quite a bit and they talk a lot about current and fishing the current how important that is to them and so i'm starting to pay even more attention to it but like like i said it there's still not always a rhyme or reason why they're there or not we could have that same and it does change you know we talked a lot some of the guests about the wind driven current and how it moves all that water to one side of the lake. And then at some point that water's got to come back and find its, you know, natural state once that wind dies down. And so there's, when we're talking current, that's kind of what we're talking about is, is yeah. wind current. But of course you have natural current from all the tributaries and things like that. And then the actual flow of the lake, you know, I assume here on it should flow from dumping the St. Clair river out towards, uh, and flow into Erie eventually. Right. But you right. get a crazy wind, right? A south wind that's going to slow it down or even perhaps change it for a little while. Well, and the biggest thing for us really is the wind driven current. Because where I fish Saginaw Bay, you have a small river that flows in Saginaw River, but that just flows in and then it basically all back flushes out through St. Clair River and it mm -hmm. takes forever in a day. So for us, really the biggest thing is that wind blown current stuff. Now I don't know how much of a difference it makes, but there are days where like, I'll go crush them and then I'll get the same wind and it'll be steady and it'll be constant and they're gone. I really mm -hmm. just think these fish just move so much. Like you just have to have so many areas to go catch these fish. I think that's sure. like the biggest misconception about Great Lakes. You can just launch a boat and always catch them. No, <laughs> you absolutely can't. Mm -mm. That's the frustrating part. Literally have yeah. to have, 20 some areas in your mind and here's the problem you know this when when you when you run into a situation where you have a commitment to a spot and it is windy and the fish aren't there it's not like you can just pick up your boat and go run 10 miles eight miles to another spot it might take you an hour to get there so yeah. that's another issue when it comes to big water smallmouth and it's all about making you know right decision th things like that what, what would you say your favorite time of the year to target smallmouth would be oh i really like the the fall like the late fall so okay. mid october until there's ice on the water because for me one no one's doing it um and two i like fishing deep and those fish want to move deep and they want to be deep and you can throw a blade bait and catch them blade like bait. i love to catch them on a blade bait or like a little small swim bait just slow dragged okay so 
Yeah. So when they're deep, fall uh, all the way up to ice out November, probably get out there in December if, if you. Yeah, if you can here. get out, you can still catch them because okay. they're all in like very, very, very compact areas. So for me, it's like just about physically being able to get out. And like if you can get out and you're not going to freeze yourself to death or freeze your boat, you're good. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'm looking for essentially is that time of year, it's it's the sand. That's when it's like really all about the sand. And I think the sand actually holds a little bit of heat or like stays warmer, especially in deeper water than the rocks. And the other big factor is, is zebra mussels. And there's this algae that grows on these rocks that attracts the zebra mussels. And I figured out a way on my Garmin to look for that. Like it looks like interference on the bottom about a quarter inch interference, but that's actually zebra mussels and like grass, I think dying off. And that's where those fish want to be. So like, it's been a really cool thing to like learn, especially on the Great Lakes, what I'm looking for and be able to find those fish deep Mm. during the winter. That's interesting. That's, that's so cool. So you were able to use your live scope to determine the bottom content and what you're kind of finding. Yeah. Not only only fish. 2D. Yeah, actually 2D. So I use 2D because like you can't hardly see it on anything else, but it looks like interference. The first time I ever saw it, I was like, why am I getting this weird fuzz off the bottom? Mm. And then I started hooking every time I cast in those areas, you get zebra mussels or you get this really short grass that was like starting to die and like pull off the rocks. And those fish would only be around that sort of bottom composition. But what it was, you'd hit the sand. And as soon as you pull it into the rocks and come off the other side, back into the sand, you'd get bit. Um, And I just have to imagine it was something about that grass dying that the zebra mussels were there. And it was just a perfect storm of, area where fish wanted to be so and your favorite setup would be a swim bait walk walk me through the swim bait setup as well as the blade bait setup if you could yeah it's pretty much the same exact setup it's like a 7-1 to a 7-3 i've been kind of mixing in between the two of them 7-1 to 7-3 medium power um and then it's uh i am playing with braids I've been using the Power Pro. I've been switching between the 832. I just need something that won't freeze. So like 10-pound test braid to 8-pound test fluorocarbon. And then on the swim bait, I'm throwing like a 3 8 or a half ounce ball head style swim bait rod or swim bait hook with a two and three quarter to three inch swim bait. And then the blade bait's nothing too crazy. It's a half ounce or it's a five eighths blade bait. Okay. Just really, really, really standard blade bait stuff. And so the the swim the swim bait is slow rolled or dragged or how are you working that just that time just year? dragged just dragged. literally turn your rod to the side and just pull it really slow. Um, for me, I just think it looks like a bait fish or a goby, just kind of slow crawling on bottom, mm-hmm. um, especially in deep water. I'm basically fishing them interchangeable. So, so walk me through the drag. Is it are you dragging and then stopping and then reeling up the slack or are you continuously reeling it's it's literally i just drag it and then as soon as i'm too far where i can't drag anymore i just reel back down and just drag it's just super 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 slow drag i want to keep that thing on bottom really doing almost nothing um you could put a grub on there you could put probably a net rig on there and catch them but it's just about having something in contact with bottom and I don't think that tail is, I don't think I'm even moving it fast enough for the tail to do it. Wow. Anymore. Okay. Sure. It's just slow pull. Well, that's the cool so, thing about swim baits. There's so many different ways to, to utilize that bait, whether it be, you know, right underneath the surface to suspended <laughs> fish, the fish on the bottom, you know, hear guys hopping it. You guys hear just ticking the bottom. Of course, this technique, keeping it on the bottom, just a slow retrieve, such a versatile bait. That's one of the things this year that I've, gotten better with and have a lot more confidence now because that was so one-dimensional when it comes to swim baits in the past is just using it these swim baits in different varieties and a lot of it i have to thank a lot of the guests that have been on this show uh who kind of share their expertise when it comes to that so this fall i'm definitely going to be uh taking a little segment from this show and and slowing it down and just dragging that 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 over the uh over the structure you so, fish cold water too, though, right? Like, what is what's your favorite cold water technique or bait? I'm a huge uh, if I can get away with it because there's some days 
as good as a blade bait is, sometimes it's just not as effective as you'd like it to be. Yeah. And so I would start with a blade bait uh, just because I love fishing it. I love the uh, the pause and then the, the strike. And I do use it on a bait caster. So I don't get to fish smallmouth as often as I'd like with a bait caster. So when I do, um, it's a lot of fun setting the hook, you know, yeah. with, that, with that blade bait. And so that would be my, my favorite technique that time of year. But I also love to throw a little Ned rig and again, slowing it down. Kind of like what you're saying is that keeping it on the bottom and, and dragging it along. I would say those are my two favorites. Of course, everyone would love to throw a jerk bait and things like that, but it seems yeah. like there's certain windows and, and opportunities through the fall and every region's a little bit different, right? When it comes to, you know, how long that bite will last. I mean, well, for me, see. like a, a jerk bait is so hard to find, like when it's perfect to be throwing a jerk bait. Like the window on the Great Lakes feels like it's not very big. Right. And so for me, it's like, I almost mm -hmm. don't even put it, put it on the deck unless I know they're going to eat it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I just got to continue to experiment. You know, every time I yeah. go, I'm always putting something different on and trying to force myself to utilize that technique a little bit more just to hopefully become familiar with it. But, you know, it seems like we all kind of go back to our, our standards, right? You're going to be drop shotting and you're going to be, uh, you know, throwing that, throwing that swim bait. What would you say is an, uh, I like to ask this a lot of our guests. What are some things you'd like to improve when it comes to smallmouth fishing? As good as an angler you are, what are some things that you wish you, you know, you would utilize more or you just would love to be able to, to use that technique more often? So just as like in, in general, I'd like to be able to understand, like be able to follow the fish more. I think one of the things I'm pretty poor at is moving around a lot. Like I don't think I move enough for these fish. Hmm. Because in my brain, I say, okay, well, last year they did this, or a week ago they were doing this. I need to be a better angler as far as moving around and making better decisions sometimes. Um, but technique-wise, I think I'd like to be better at cranking or fishing a jerk bait. Okay. Um, I can catch them on a crankbait, but for me it's like, man, I pray they're eating it today. Like, it's not, I'm going to go out and smash them on a crankbait. Right. It's a so. fun way to fish. I think guys that, that target smallmouth in inland lakes, or if you are like super in tune to what's going on on the Great Lakes, you can get into them pretty good with cranking. But I, I'm in your same position. Uh, inland versus Great Lakes, a little different when it comes to cranking, I feel. And yeah. uh, it's just a technique I don't utilize enough. I think I'm fishing the wrong areas, man. I always get that crap, that 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 algae crap on my hooks, you know, it, it, whenever it ticks bottom, they say you're supposed to tick bottom with it. Well, it ticks bottom and then, and then it's all algae <laughs> up. So what do I do? You know, dude, like for me, it's been so weird. Cause I'll get on like really good crankbait bites and I'll feel really good about myself. Like, man, I'm starting to learn this thing. And then all of a sudden it's like shuts off and other guys are still catching them on it. And I'm like, what are the decisions they're making? Like, what am I doing with this crankbait? That's wrong. Or like you said, dude, I'm, maybe I'm fishing the wrong areas where, we don't get a lot of algae. Like it's, it's really short perch grass, hmm. but a lot of the stuff that I'm fishing, it's like, what, what am I doing wrong that I'm not still catching them on a crankbait? Maybe it's but, area. Maybe it's a decision. Maybe it's the you know. days you've had success with crankbaits. Uh, what are some of the top crankbait uh, brands that you throw? Um, I like the dredger. I mean, that's not like a Berkeley plug. I like the size of a dredger. It's, it's really, really small bait and it gets down really fast. I like the DTs, like the DT 10 is probably my favorite Rapala DT. Um, mm -hmm. And then I uh, bomber fat, fear, fat free shad, okay. the BD seven. So it's a little bit bigger body bait dives to like 16 foot of water, but it's really, really loud. So I'll put it on like 14 pound test or 15 pound test line and let it get to bottom. Like, create a lot of commotion, be a loud presence. And for me, that's a dirty water bait. Like when I'm catching them on a crankbait in an area and I know they should still be there, but the water's really off color. Like I'm going to that bait over like a smaller okay. body, like small mall style crankbait. Mm -hmm. And like chartreuse blue is a really, really, it's one of my favorite colors. Okay, sure. So I assume, is it more of a blue back with some chartreuse? Yeah, going yeah it's like a, okay. Yeah, it's like a powder blue back with chartreuse sides, mm -hmm. but I like that color. Um, 
pretty much dirty water and clean water it's like white with chartreuse back or just really natural colors perfect so. getting back uh real quick because before we uh get into a couple other questions i have that i'd like to ask everybody on the show i, I want to circle back again with electronics because i know you're really dialed into that we talked a little bit about some of the color palettes and we hinted that early on in the show uh what are some of your favorite color palettes to use with this live scope um a lot of times when i'm fishing cover like i'm fishing that deep stuff and i'm looking for like boulders i really like the amber color just like the standard amber color i think you get really good shadows off of it and it actually like shows the contour really effectively my problem with that color is it's not super high contrast so like picking out individual fish can be kind of hard even with the color gain turn way up so i've been playing with the new aqua palette which i really like for actually seeing individual fish on stuff especially mm -hmm. if i i know the cover down there super high contrast color and you can pick out like individual fish or like see even between like two fish, you can tell if it's two versus the one that tend to blend together in your amber color. Um, I'm writing that down now. Aqua. Yeah, yeah aqua is a really good okay. new color. And then if you fish anywhere that there's wood on the bottom, try emerald. Emerald, mm -hmm. for some reason, you can't necessarily see the fish around it here as well for some reason, but it stands out like the wood stands out ridiculously well. So those are the three I'm playing with. Um, Aqua, I've been in love with over the last like month and a half. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm but for me, it's. I'm heading out next week. I'm gonna give that a uh, give that a try. Try, it, yeah. It's it's a cool color. The one big thing I recommend with that color is turn your color gain up a little bit, and then you should be good to go. I mean, just adjust it like you would any other color, but have the color gain up, and that's gonna really make sure. stuff pop. Yeah, that's the biggest tip I can give anyone. You know, I have, I'm sure you get calls and your buddies and stuff and say, hey, man, you got to set my live scope up for me. And, you know, I'm like, well, first of all, just do a good YouTube search. There's some great <laughs> videos out there, right? And color choice really is how your eyes look at that screen and determine things. Like, it's not the same for everybody. I promise you that. Yeah. And second of all is that the color gain, not the gain, the color gain setting. Yeah. When people complain they can't see their baits, that's one of the first things you should do is bump that up because it's always on a default setting and you got another 30, 40 clicks up before you max that thing out. Yeah. And I don't know if you agree with that statement, but. No, that that's that's for sure. Like if you can't see your bait on live scope, it's not the gain. It's your gain is probably set pretty close. Because you, they'll be like, man, I can just occasionally see it sort of blip in and out of the screen. Well, that's because your color gain is too low. So that thing that is blipping in and out of the screen, that's that's there. You have to turn that color gain up and then just adjust your gain based on the color gain. Mm. And we're always, I seem to be changing it constantly depending on the, the bottom content, the depth, the body of water, everything. And sometimes it's daily and sometimes it's all constantly. I wish, you're, I wish you could just read my mind. You know what I mean? I'm always <laughs> yeah. fussing with that thing. I'm always dialing it in. For me, it's like I get out there and a lot of times I'll go, what I'll do is I'll turn the unit on, set it to auto medium gain, and then I'll adjust it up a couple clicks from there because I want just a touch of fuzziness like close to the boat because that makes my picture way clearer, way out away from the boat, mm -hmm. and then play with your color gain. And I literally change it all throughout the day. Right. But do you so here's a question for you do you play with the depth like i know a lot of people have it set at like manual mm -hmm. depth and they adjust it people love and a lot of these youtube videos that you're going to watch are going to say you don't want it on auto you want to be able to adjust it yourself well i'll tell you what the places i fish i'm not sitting on a 30 foot flat all day i'm in eight feet of water over here and 30 over here like i have to have it on auto I mean, it's rare I don't have it on auto. I, That's just me personally. Unless I'm in like real shallow water to where I'm getting such a hard return off bottom that it makes my screen look funny, it's on auto. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I fish, I'll fish, i fish a spot, like a rock pile in five foot of water here, and then I'll be out in 30 foot of water checking some boulders. If I don't have that thing on yep. auto, I am 
or, yeah. or I'm fishing these weird contour changes. Yep. Like yep. I, I need it on auto. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's one of the, uh, I don't want to call I, it I the cringe. Biggest, yeah. I cringe when I see people talk about that. And listen, if you're, I mean, Liz, we both have thousands of hours on our live scopes. Okay. And so there's probably a time and place when you just want that reading, you know, you're in 20 feet of water and you want that reading at 24 feet. I get it. Um, it just doesn't, that situation doesn't occur that often for, a, for me on the Great Lakes. Yeah. Agreed. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Such a useful tool though. I mean, I. what's your biggest use for it? Like, like really, what is your biggest use for live scope? Is it catching fish? Is it, is, is it, it seeing yeah. cover? Is it, no, it's finding the fish. That's 100% how I do it. I hunt, I hunt them down. I find them and I, I make them bite. Um, that's my, that's the enjoyment I get out of it. Now, of course, finding the structure, I've learned so much. Now I run 360 as well. It's my first year. It's been a few years since I had 360 as well. And a lot of people ask, well, what would you rather have a hands down live scope? But 360 also allows you to kind of see things you may, may have missed with the live scope. But at the same time, I can find every piece of boulder with the live scope that you can with your 360 for the most part, if you're yep. using it properly in that area. So there's hands down live scope is way better unless you're more of a shallow angler and you know, you want to be more, you, you're not always targeting small mouth. You do a little bit of large mouth fishing, stuff like that. Then if you can only uh, decide to only have one technology, then maybe you are better off with 360, but running both is awesome. Um, running three live scopes is even better. So once you get to that stage, <laughs> then you're doing something right. You know, That's but um, I love it, dude. Like I, I, I couldn't live without three after using three live scopes. Really? And yeah, once, once you have one on down constantly, one forward and then one on a pole when you're anchor locked or in big, big waves and you can just take that pole and I, I thought I was going to need one that rotated with, with the remote. Yeah. I don't think so. When you're locked in an area and you can manually just make super small adjustments and follow that little fish out there and you're in three, four footers on spot lock and trying to cast a little drop shot out to that fish. It's so much easier just by hand. And even if you miss it a little bit, you can adjust it and then see if, maybe that fish saw that bait fall, Yeah, you know, if, even though you're, you're 10 feet off, you can see if that fish is going to react. And if he does hold your rod still, cause he's coming, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, yeah. uh, it's so much fun. It, Dude, have you played with perspective mode much? Because mm -hmm. this is something I've started exploring. So talk to me, me about it. So for me, it's not so much like the shallow water stuff. I don't really think it works that well, right? Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but like, the glacial style lakes, we've touched on it, kind of hinted at it. The glacial lakes up here, we have those steep, steep drops. You can use that live scope and stay not only on the break with perspective mode, but you can actually scan for those fish that are like suspended up on the break. And you can start to get glimpses of them off the break. So I kind of use it twofold. And this is real. This is the dumbest use of perspective mode ever. Like I won't deny this, but literally use it to keep my boat positioned exactly on the break and then be able to semi fish these baits off of the break and see a fish are there. Hmm. It's really dumb. It's not a good use of it, but it's, it's a pretty cool way to use it when it doesn't hey. seem like forwards working. And you're able to see those in it's working fine in that 20, 30 feet of water. It works to about, you know, 10 foot down, but a lot of times off that break on a glacial body of water, those fish are hanging like almost level or just below that break. Hmm. So the, a lot of times the water on the shelf is in like five, six foot of water. And if I can see those fish in 10 foot of water off the break, I'm pretty good. Cause I'm not going to see those fish anyways. I'm forward unless I'm scanning way off the break. Right. Yep. No, but it's, it, it's cool. It's unique. It's very situational, but mm -hmm. yeah. and I even think forward view on a, uh, I call it like steps. When you have that, that slate rock that's in stair steps going down yeah. to 40, very difficult to, uh, 
to spot a fish. I mean, you can, but it's probably the hardest piece of structure to to it's, find fish it, living on when you have miserable. such. Yeah, your screen's constantly going like this, and you'll catch a glimpse. And if you have it lined up perfect and everything lines up, you can maybe get a cast to that fish. But it's definitely uh, definitely can be a challenge for sure. Yeah, man, good I stuff. We, I was I was curious. Yeah, no, we could probably do a two hour live just on live scope and, and <laughs> our thoughts on that and different settings and things like that. But it really just comes with experience and utilizing that all the time. You know, like I tell people, I, I have a hard time imagining being able to fish without that technology. Uh, it just wouldn't be as fun. You know, I don't even know how we did it with 2d back in the day. I have no idea how we did it. It'd be so no tough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> So tough. So what's your personal best smallmouth? Six, nine. Six, I want to catch a seven so bad, dude. Like uh -huh. that's, that's on my bucket list for this year. That's my goal. Like I want to catch a seven so bad, but in my brain, like I have this mindset, I want to catch it where I want to catch it, how I want to catch it. And it's just like, I are they catch out there? Here. They live there, right? I want to catch it on here on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I know of maybe one person that's got a seven out there hmm. and I just want to do it. But realistically i think it's probably going to happen in canada it's going to happen when i make a trip somewhere up to like lake michigan or whatever but right right yeah yeah well i mean a six nine that's nothing to uh i mean that's a big old fish right it's, that thing's been yeah living. the problem is their lifespan just runs out right they expire um it's hard especially to on the great thing. especially on the great lakes like i think I think if we see another mega giant fish, it's going to come out of an inland lake, like a really deep, clear glacial body of water where these fish aren't necessarily fighting current and they're not fighting all these conditions. Like it can't come. I'm sure there's a 10 pounder living in the great lakes, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's like one to be able to narrow that one or a couple fish down to be able to catch it. And two, like for that fish to live long enough. Right. That's where I yeah. think the struggle is. What did you catch that six nine on? I and mean, tell I us, tell us about the story. Crank it. Yeah, yeah. So like, this was the first year that I really started getting dialed in on here on, um, and I was cranking this grass bed that doesn't exist anymore. The water's too high, and it killed it off. Anyways, I was cranking this grass bed. I saw these fish out there, and I had just caught a couple like four and a half five pounders. Cast this crankbait in, and I see this fish followed up on panoptics. And so I pop my rod just to try and get this fish to react. And as I pop it up and I turn that handle one more time, he eats it with about eight foot of line out. And so without thinking, thinking it's another four, I literally just turn my body and flip this fish in the boat. Really? Yeah. Just like, wow. Pop crank and just flip him in the boat. And it's, it was over. <laughs> that like was that it. fish had the bait <laughs> crushed. I mean, this guy's so lucky nothing happened, but right. you know, it was a giant freak of nature. Do uh, Lake Huron fish, do they jump initially? Do they stay stay down? What, what's the fight like? They jump like, I don't care if they're in 30 water or two foot of water. Like as soon as you hit them, their first instinct is to come up straight up. And then they'll go back down and dive and dig on you really hard. Uh -huh. But they're not like, a lot of times after that first jump or two, they're pretty much like they'll dig and they'll just go. But yeah, they all, it doesn't matter where you catch them. They're all coming straight up out of the water. Do you find that changes from year to year or no? How they act? Yeah. I think when, it changes seasons to, season to season more than it does year uh -huh. to year for me. Um, yeah. Why? Does it change year to year for you? I, I, I feel it does, man. Like I feel some years it's uh, when you're catching these deep fish, it's straight up and they're going to come up and then they're going to go back down. Other years, like this year, it's they don't <laughs> jump. Like really? I'm trying to figure out why, you know what I mean? Cause it, I catch a lot of fish. It's a consistency. Yeah. I, I grant there's going to be some fish that jump. Right. But the majority of them, I can think of three years ago when that's all they did every single time. Yeah. And so for me to be able to take note, I realize there's something going on. Are they, is and it similar just, areas? Is similar, it similar areas? Not, similar, maybe not sim. It's, it's or depth, similar depths, you know? Yeah, it's kind of it's really strange. It's it's strange because I love I mean, it sounds <laughs> stupid. But dude, I love it when they first come up 
I get really? to see what I'm dealing with. You know what I mean? Sometimes when you're dealing with a three pounder, it feels like a six and, and you want, you got to take your time with this thing and blah, blah, blah. And you just, you waste so much time fighting a three pounder when they do come up, you know, right away. And, and with today's drop shot hooks and our rods, it's yeah, you're going to lose some here and there, but majority of the time, if you can get past that first jump, they're staying on. Yeah. And then you have the patience to be like, okay, this is a pig. I'm just going to play him out. Let him do his thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let him run around as long as your drag's set. But I, I was just curious. I'm, I'm actually, that's one of the things that kind of fascinates me. And I've been trying to take note and trying to figure out what the reason is behind that. And of course, every lake's different, you know, um, inland lake fish, even an inland lake in the same state will sometimes fight differently than another lake right next door. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen that. So it's no, for me, it's more so like depth and seasonality. Like early, okay. early season cold water, I don't think they're jumping. Mine hardly ever jump, mm -hmm. but now they're jump like initial hook set, they're going to jump. Wow. I have this kid, Justice, up here who caught a fit yes fish yesterday. Uh huh. Literally, he hooked this thing and it was below the boat in 15 foot of water. Before I could bend down, grab the net, and lower myself, this fish jumped out of the water and was so high that. I netted it up like this and caught yeah. the fish. Like it was right. so high out of the water. That's another so, thing. When they are jumping and you're dropping straight down on them, you got a team partner, you got someone who's fast. Dude. You could get them in the net that first hook. Yeah. Set. Yeah. That's because the they part. jump so yeah. high right there. Dude. Boom. Yeah. If yep. you can, you just catch them. Yeah. If you can't, well, you got eight minutes of, uh, of fighting this fish <laughs> now, buddy. Good job. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so cool. Okay. If you could use one, bait the rest of your life now nah, let's not go the rest of your life just one season okay for smallmouth what would that bait be a drop shot yeah well, that's drop technique shot. i need to know the bait oh, a bait one bait a hit worm a hit worm yeah the berkeley hit worm that bait okay so on a drop shot on a needle rig on a net rig that bait can do pretty much anything i need it to do as far as like finesse like lighter line techniques go or i can put okay. it on the back of a hair jig that thing is legit hit worm yeah okay let's take it one step further now it's only one color it's gonna be green pumpkin purple okay yep yeah just super super basic color but it works everywhere and catches them it does yeah. and that's been the theme yep. it's been green pumpkin maybe a little purple some guys like a little bit of gold <laughs> but uh i agree yeah. a lot of people a lot of companies call that kind of their goby color right yeah yeah yep yeah for some reason you put a little bit of purple in there um so mama love it yeah i don't it's know so crazy, i don't really they, know how much it matters like i really don't right right but it makes me feel better mm -hmm. i'm with you so. i'm with you it seems to me like either that fish wants something totally crazy like bright chartreuse or bright pink or they want something more natural and yeah. every day's different. Um, I'm not the, do you can change colors fish? a lot? Do you change I, colors I, a lot? I will. When I can't, when I seem like I, I can see these fish, sometimes you can see them, how they react to it on the, on the graph, but nine times out of the 10, they bite. If you find them. Yeah. Right? I've seen that. But too. there is like, days when they are in a very interesting mood and we know the fish are there. You can kind of verify that they are smallmouth, and sometimes a color change will make a difference. I think more profile of a bait over a color change, and I think the way you work that bait. You know, some days I've seen it where you can drop on a fish and you have to dead stick that drop shot and just wait for them to come and pick it up. And there's other days where you have to reel up again and keep dropping on that same fish multiple times, and then it's just going to eventually grab it yeah yeah so man. there's so many so many uncontrollables that there's so many things we just don't understand or know and every fish i believe has a different attitude you know there's there's just it's that really the attitude of that fish i think there's times seasonal conditions will kind of put those fish at a you know a scale of one to ten these fishes are all in a yeah they're more number neutral. four they're mood like, right yeah yeah but there's times where you can find a number four mood and then the next fish is going to be a number eight mood fish. Like he's just ready to go. So I don't know. 
I think I right now, so like for me, right now is where fish are all across the board. Like you'll mm-hmm. find some fish that will eat immediately. Like you could flip out to them and be 20 foot away and that fish is still going to eat that bait. Or you could drop on that fish and literally donk him in the head and he does mm-hmm. not care. It's just like a shallow fish, man. You could you could have your boat right over that fish. You could have your power poles like went right on top of the fish's <laughs> back practically and he's going to bite it. And the next shallow fish you come up on, you're right underneath the boat. He's just chilling in the shade line, and he will not bite. So yeah, I think it has a lot to do with with those individual fish and how they how they kind of react. What do you think separates yourself from some of the other, uh, you know, anglers when it comes to smallmouth fishing? What makes you so successful? What would you is it? Can you pinpoint it to one thing, or is it more uh, a, a, a number of different things? I think the biggest thing is just I've been able to spend a lot of time on the water and like really paying attention to what's going on, really like paying attention to what's going on around me and, and say, okay, well, these are the conditions. I know how the fish should act, which bites me in the butt sometimes, but I have the experience to understand how I should make the movements. And so like, if I could give a piece of advice to anyone fishing, it's just spend as much time on the water as you possibly can. So you can put as many experiences under your belt to like have to rely on. Good advice. No, that makes perfect sense. Good stuff. Well, we are definitely running short on time. This was some great information that you shared with us. Uh, if people want to learn a little bit more about, about yourself and uh, kind of follow you along on social media, what's the best way to uh, get a hold of you? Yeah. So I'm on YouTube, um, Benjamin Nowak YouTube channel. And then, um, on Instagram, it's BR Noak Fishing. And uh, th- that's how you can find me on pretty much all my social media. Benjamin Noak, you guys should be able to find me and follow along. And I'll have some fun catching fish. And if you have any questions, hit me up on all the socials. So Awesome. Very good. Well, thanks again for joining us. It was a pleasure. We'll definitely Thank have you, to uh, have you back. And we, we got to get you on one of these lives uh, coming up too. Yeah. In the future. Maybe uh, maybe later on in the wintertime, we'll, 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 we'll dig in a little bit more. I want to definitely pick your brain a little bit more about uh, electronics and, and it's just, it's very fascinating because yes, it's a, uh, it's a great tool, but you got to know how to use it and everyone's got their little ways to tweak it. And so that, yeah. that definitely fascinates me. I want to learn a little bit more about that again, guys. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us, the viewers, the listeners, let me know in the comments, where do we take season two? I'm struggling here. I'm getting worried. We're going to figure it all out. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the water. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.